Everdell is the first entry in my game design hall of fame. Build a city full of industrious woodland creatures. Shops, schools, courthouses, theatres. It's a snapshot of a thriving community. And of course, each of these buildings does something. The farms generate berries, the mine produces pebbles, and the resin refinery refines, well, resin. Each of these constructions potentially houses a cute little critter. The bat historian lives in the clock tower, the postal pigeon occupies the post office, the badger innkeeper takes up residence at the inn. And so we see our woodland valley develop through four seasons, sending out workers, gathering resources, exploiting the unique abilities of their constructions and critters to maximise production, and ultimately generating victory points to determine the most successful woodland civilization. Everdell was released to much acclaim in 2018 and followed by a series of expansions. Pearlbrook was the first, allowing us to explore the underwater world adjacent to the Valley of Everdell. Each player receives an additional frog worker who can visit locations and characters that no land-dwelling worker can. And this is generally in the pursuit of pearls. New resources which can be spent to adorn your city with fancy items, all of which open up new point scoring opportunities. Or you may wish to gather enough together to build a wonder, high scoring structures which use a lot of resources to build. And of course, there are new water based characters and constructions to build in your city. Belfair and Spirecrest followed. Belfair was a modular expansion introducing multiple new ways to enhance the game. You could pick and choose whether you wanted to use the new market board, the garland awards, or the special player powers. Spirecrest sees your community struggle through challenging weather conditions. Each season has a different constraint on the way that you play the game. As players transition from season to season, their rabbit explorer advances along the Spirecrest board, picking up new scoring criteria and special abilities. Not least the giant critters, which allocate a special ability to one of your workers, who gets to spend the rest of the game sat atop one of these massive beasts. The New Leaf and Mistwood expansions arrived alongside a humongous complete collection in 2022. New Leaf introduces a massive number of new cards, characters and constructions, which sit on a station board alongside the main board, essentially expanding the usual selection of cards available to players in the meadow area. There are additional modules which allow you to reserve cards, to move workers and claim visitors who have specific requirements to be met by game end in order to gift you with additional victory points. The Mistwood expansion focuses primarily, but not exclusively, on solo play, with a detailed and relatively complex AI spider opponent to compete against. And aside from these five big boxed expansions, there are many additional promotional items, and items which were included only in collector's editions. More cards, more tokens, more player powers. And the easiest way to make sure you have everything is to pick up the complete collection, which contains all gameplay content for the system. And we're assured that Everdell is finished, with no more content forthcoming. Though we've heard that before. I'm Adam Porter. I'm a board game designer and, of course, an avid player. And I've played a lot of Everdell over the last few years, and it makes a fascinating case study for design decisions in an expanding system. Like an amphibian ambassador diving beneath the surface of the Pearlbrook River, I'm going to delve deep into the design of Everdell and highlight many of the design choices and the implications they have for the wider system and the user experience. Inevitably, that means there will be positive observations, but some of the analysis will be critical. So I want to preempt this by saying that Everdell is one of my favourite games of all time. When I did my top 100 list in 2021, it hit my top 50. Now I haven't considered an updated list recently, but I have little doubt that in 2022, Everdell would be in the top 5. My appreciation of the game has only grown with the wealth of available expansions. Everdell is a tableau builder. So there's our first bit of gaming jargon. It puts Everdell in the same category as Seven Wonders, Race for the Galaxy, and Wingspan. Traditionally, a tableau refers to a static image, a collection of figures posed for dramatic effect, absorbed and unaware of the observer. So in Everdell, we see a collection of woodland creatures and constructions gathered to represent a bustling city on the tabletop. 
The gaming community has adapted the term tableau for our own needs, and we stray a little from the traditional because our tableaus are dynamic. We can activate character abilities, upgrade cards, combine effects, even utilising the tableaus in front of other players. Our tableaus function like an engine. When cleverly constructed, each card in the tableau fires off another one, generating escalating rewards on every subsequent turn. These games are often called engine builders. I discuss the most common elements of tableau building games in detail in the video linked above, but Everdell has many of the main components covered. The blue cards have ongoing effects, which ensure that each subsequent turn is better than the last. The brown cards activate as soon as they're placed, usually with a big one-off reward. The red cards need to be activated with a token, increasing tactical options. The green cards activate when certain events occur, allowing for forward planning. And the purple cards are used for endgame scoring, signposting you towards a certain strategy. These are pretty standard for the genre. You'll see a similar categorization of cards in Bruges, Abyss, San Juan, and other tableau building games. Everdell is an action selection game. That is to say, on your turn, there are a bunch of possible actions available to you, and you select one of them. More specifically, Everdell is a worker placement game, a very popular subgenre of action selection. That puts it in the same genre as Agricola. And there's another very common bit of gaming jargon. Worker placement games involve the placement of tokens onto board spaces to indicate which action you want to take. But crucially, positioning your worker token blocks other players from taking the same action. This scarcity of action spaces, and hence availability of resources, provides much of the tension in a worker placement game. Everdell has a mix of closed action spaces, where only one player can position a worker, and open action spaces, where any number of players can visit. Some of these action spaces are drawn from a deck at the start of the game, so resources are available in different quantities in different games, forcing players to adapt their strategies and adding variety to the game. Expansions incorporate new action spaces, such as the river board in Pearlbrook, which can only be visited by the frog worker. The market board in Belfair, which allows you to trade resources and cards for points and the station board in New Leaf, which gives access to resources along with endgame scoring visitor cards. Everdell creator James Wilson discusses his design process in the Everdell Art and Law book, Tales from the Green Acorn. The prototype game designed by Wilson had a generic city-building theme. It was after licensing the publishing rights that Starling Games suggested a woodland setting full of cute little creatures. It's worth reflecting on whether the game would have garnered the positive attention that it did upon release had the publisher stuck with the original generic setting. Despite its US origins, Everdell is a Euro game at heart, another piece of gaming jargon loosely describing a low-luck, low-confrontation strategy game with a constructive theme. City building, tableaus, worker placement, and victory point engines are ten a penny in the Eurogame genre, and early examples always had very dry, somewhat boring historical settings. They were designed for adults, and publishers went to great lengths to ensure that they shook off the trappings of traditional children's games. Starling Games spotted an opportunity, and their timing couldn't have been better. There is no shortage of animal-themed games in the hobby. My 2021 Top 100 board games featured eight games based around anthropomorphic creatures. Where most of these games used anthropomorphism very superficially, the animals were primarily there for humour, Everdell was different because it illustrated a diverse, interwoven world of characters. Some earnest, some industrious, some villainous, some adventurous. It immediately recalled familiar stories like Wind in the Willows or Watership Down. As a child, I was particularly fond of the book Mrs Frisbee and the Rats of Nim, later animated into the Don Bluth film The Secret of Nim. Later on, I discovered the wonderful Red Wall novels and Mouse Guard comics. Everdell may not have been the first game with anthropomorphic animals, but it was the first to tap into this specific genre, woodland creatures with richly developed world building. 
Just as Disney Pixar blurred the boundary between animation for children and animation for adults, Starling Games recognised that the hobby game market has moved on. In 2018, gamers had no qualms about playing games with traditionally childish narratives. In fact, many were looking for lighter, more inviting themes, with fewer bored-looking historical dudes plastered over the game boxes and components. It's more art than science spotting a commercially attractive theme or setting. It often seems more luck than judgement. It happened for Elizabeth Hargrave with her bird-themed wingspan, and it happened for Starling Games when they made the decision to switch from generic medieval village to Red Wall-inspired woodland community. It was the best decision they could have made, and ultimately set the game on a path towards massive commercial success. It can't have been cheap commissioning the quantity and quality of artwork produced for the game, but it was money well spent. Andrew Bosley's art is stunning, and undoubtedly had a massive impact on getting the game noticed. More than that though, his artwork enhances the experience significantly. After many plays of the game, I still gaze at the cards in awe every time I play, and discovering the massive new deck of characters and locations in the recent expansion New Leaf has been a particular joy. So what lessons can we take from Everdell? 1. It's perfectly fine to riff on a well-established genre. There's little that's genuinely innovative in the mechanisms of Everdell, but it's complex enough that this specific combination of worker placement, hand management, and tableau building feels fresh and exciting. 2. Theme matters. It really, really matters. Not to every gamer, not to every purchaser, but aesthetics generates interest in a game. It enhances the experience of playing, and a well-chosen theme massively increases the commercial prospects of a project. But that's not really actionable advice, right? If it was that easy to pick out the next big thing, everyone would be doing it. The best we can do is spot an interesting new narrative and take a punt on it. So let's get down to the nitty gritty, the mechanisms at play. If you've ever watched any of my reviews, you'll know that I have my own engagement ladder system, where I rate games from 0 to 3 in five different categories. And a total score of 10 or above indicates a hugely engaging game and a real favourite with me. Everdell is wonderfully immersive, mainly because of the great art. As with all games, there are some leaps for the players to make if they want to buy into the narrative. I mean, who exactly are our workers? And how do they relate to the critters on the cards in our tableau? If I choose to play as squirrels or toads or lizards, what does that actually mean? Are these guys running the show, making decisions and planning services? Or are they the manual workers doing all the heavy lifting while our card critters live a life of luxury? And what's all that business with the seasons about? How come I can be in spring while my opponent has moved on to summer? And this minor gripe is highlighted further in the Spirecrest expansion, where one player could be struggling against a tornado, while another endures a heatwave. Does this matter? Well, not at all. Games generally resemble somewhat abstract puzzles, and a true simulation would be pretty tedious. The characters are so well drawn. Over subsequent plays, you get to know them. Of course, you don't get a real sense of their personality, but you do develop favourites based on your own preferred style of play. There are certain characters I always gravitate towards, others that I pretty much always shun. At its core, this is a strategic choice, but it's so hard to separate theme and mechanisms here. All I know is that I want that cute little chip sweep in my city. Everdale features moderate player interaction too. Like most worker placement games, the interaction is often accidental, with players blocking spaces or gathering cards that other players wanted. It does dabble with more direct interaction though. The negative scoring fool card is placed into an opponent's city when you play it, rather than your own. I find this sort of destructive interaction less successful. Because the deck is so large, the fool from the base game and the pirate ship from Pearlbrook crop up infrequently. And as such, they stick out as a bit of an oddity. Everdell just isn't that sort of cutthroat experience. And I've often seen these cards generate groans from players. They're actually handled pretty well, with opportunities from other cards to turn these negative scoring space hogging cards into positives. But nonetheless, to me they don't feel like they belong. Indeed, Everdell is frequently a game full of positive interaction. There are many, many cards which award your opponents with resources, cards or victory points whenever you take an action. 
It should be said that if you do enjoy direct attack cards, you'd do well to incorporate the Rugwart promo cards from the Everdell Collector's Edition. These cards offer additional take that opportunities if you like that sort of thing. Another form of direct interaction comes in the form of worker placement action spaces on some of the cards. And any player can use these, even if they sit in your own tableau. It's a nice idea, but it requires players to keep tabs on what all the other players have in front of them. And the writing on Everdell cards is tiny, so it can be tedious when players start peering at every card display on the table looking for opportunities. The Pearlbrook expansion features signposts to indicate if a card location is available. A nice feature, but really one which simply serves to highlight that there's a bit of an issue here. Likewise with the card effects which allow you to copy an opponent's abilities. These tend to slow the game down while players explore all the options on the table. This is not game-breaking stuff at all, but game designers do need to consider the impact such additions can have on the flow of a game. Can your design bear it? Or does the inclusion of such interactive cards reduce the game to a slog? This might be a kill your darlings moment. Sometimes wonderful ideas need to be sacrificed to maintain energy, momentum and progression in a game. For stress and challenge, Everdell scores very high. The game is tight. You can never do enough, never get everything that you want. It comes from the same school of design as Agricola, where you're constantly struggling to feed your family and avoid punishing begging cards. I really think the tension in Everdell is its greatest asset but also a bit of a curse. Everdell is a game that you can excel at because every action matters. A strong player will almost always beat a weaker one. There's a lot of scope for developing your skills. Put simply, it's a serious, complex game which will appeal to experienced gamers. The flip side of this is that the game feels extremely restrictive to new players. You start the game with nothing, just a handful of cards and two workers. That first season flies by and you often feel like you've achieved nothing. It gets commented on a lot when I play the game with newcomers. Everdell just doesn't feel as generous in the early game as other titles in the genre. Of course, things pick up in later rounds, but it's always punishing and constrained. At times, the limitations in Everdell actually tip over into preventing you from actually playing the game, holding back the fun. For example, the cemetery, which locks up one of your workers permanently. Admittedly, you gain a great reward, and it's a strong move in the final round, but the trade-off you're making is, I'll play the game a bit less in order to gain some points. It's a fine strategic decision, but is it fun? Imagine a card game where each round players tend to score between 10 and 20 points. At the start of a round, you're presented with the option of sitting out the round and automatically scoring 15. It would be a sound strategic move, but you're not playing the game. To be fair, Everdell uses these sort of options sparingly. It's something I see frequently in prototype game designs and often something I find myself incorporating and then having to remove later from my own designs. If you're looking for unique card powers, you're generally looking for different ways that players can break the core rules. And one option that always presents itself is the possibility of giving up an action in return for victory points or some other reward. I always try to strip these powers out of my designs. I want to direct my players towards the most engaging parts of the game, not encourage them to sidestep the fun. The design philosophy in Everdell, particularly in Spirecrest, seems to be give with one hand, take away with the other. It's a practical approach for keeping a game tight without a sprawling duration and no abundance of resources. In Spirecrest, players gain some great rewards at the end of each season, scoring objectives for example, or giant workers with special powers. But each new round has a weather card applied to it, and these are always brutal. They often cancel out one large section of the board for that entire round. You can't use the meadow cards, for example, or you can't use forest locations, or sometimes the cost of various actions is increased, so every card costs an additional resource to play, or you must discard a card every time you play a card. It changes the focus of each new round, the way you plan your moves, and it brings a lot of variety to the game, but it is always greeted with a groan. None of the weather cards are positive. It's never a sunny day with an abundance of berries. It's always a hurricane. If the designer wanted to guide players to explore different options, perhaps to focus more on the meadow in a certain round, this could be incentivized with positive rewards. Perhaps a discount on meadow cards rather than a limitation. 
This would have the same effect on game flow without the groans. But it would make the game easier, with less tension, because players would amass cards and resources more quickly. The dilemma for designers is whether to allow this power creep and escalation, or dampen it at the cost of deterring players with constant barriers and limitations. Everdell swings totally the other way with its New Leaf expansion. This adds an extra board with additional cards available for all players to pick from. More options. But the expansion doesn't stop there. Each player gets a token, which allows them to reserve a card from the Meadow or Station and then play it with a discount on a future turn. And players also have a ticket, which can be used twice in the game to move one of their workers to a new spot. Essentially, two additional turns in the game. But also, opening up the possibility that action spaces will become available for other players midway through a round of play. This makes the game a lot easier, a lot looser, and less punishing. The station board offers up some new options, but it's easy to overlook because there's so much going on already, and the tickets and reserve tokens have already made it easier to progress with the basic meadow and deck cards. New Leaf feels like a fix for players who find the base game or the Spirecrest expansion too punishing. When combined, the extra options really take the edge off the harsh weather effects from Spirecrest. If the meadow isn't available, or you're prevented from playing cards from your hand, well, the new selection of station cards gives you something to work with. The beauty of the evolved product line is that you can adapt Everdell to your personal taste. The base game is restrictive, and if you enjoy that, well, you can make it more so with Spirecrest. But if you're looking for an easier ride, more Caverna than Agricola, then Belfair's player powers or New Leaf's additional modules might help you out. The next category on my engagement ladder is feedback. This encompasses all the different ways that you interact with a game, but more importantly, what the game gives back, the ways that the game responds to your input. Everdell offers great feedback. Every action you take advances your position. Often one action will fire off a series of card effects and special abilities producing generous rewards, additional cards, resources, and victory points. Each construction in your city can house a specific creature, allowing you to play that creature for free if you have the appropriate building, bypassing the usual cost in berries. By the final turns of the game, you'll be amassing large numbers of resources, in quantities that you couldn't have imagined during that desperately barren first season. One of Everdell's greatest strengths is that every action you take feels impactful. And that leaves my final category, meaningful choices. Everdell is packed with them. Players can, however, be blighted with bad luck, or at least they can perceive that luck plays a large role in deciding the victor of the game. The issue is similar to that seen in other tableau builders with massive decks of cards, Arc Nova, Wingspan, and Terraforming Mars. Players are instinctively drawn towards the risky strategy of waiting for their preferred card to come out of the deck. They invested a lot of resources in building that castle, so they cling to the hope that they might just happen upon the king, who will occupy it for free, if he turns up. And of course, pursuing such a strategy sometimes leaves a sour taste, because that deck is enormous, and sometimes luck just isn't on your side. A run of unlucky card draws can be all the more disappointing when your opponents seem to be amassing freebies all over the place, with favourable card draws on every turn just because luck was on their side. Of course, the reality is much more nuanced. A skilled, experienced player won't hang all their hopes on an improbable card draw, but will do the best they can with the cards and resources at hand. But that doesn't change the perception of new players. The issue is compounded once you mix promo cards, and especially the multitude of Pearlbrook cards, into the main deck. New Leaf, on the other hand, relieves the issue a little bit by providing constructions which many different characters could potentially occupy. So a residence for blue critters, or a critter who could live in any red building. This is a great way of expanding the deck without reducing the potential for powerful card combinations. So the overall score for Everdell is 13, a magnificent total. I do, however, deduct points for aspects of gameplay which reduce engagement, and in this case, it's the unusual flow of the game and the excessive duration with larger player count. Everdell is a fairly snappy game with two players. It takes a substantial chunk of an evening to play it with a full complement of four players. And once you incorporate expansions at higher player counts, the game does start to drag. The issue is downtime. 
Everdell is a complex strategic game, and it takes time to work through all your available options. Much of that calculation can be done in between your turns, but the board state can change, both in terms of available cards in the display and available action spaces, so you might have to rethink your plans when your turn comes around. Personally, I prefer to play the expanded game with two players only. With three or four players, I would probably stick to the base game only, and I don't ever see myself playing the game with five or six. I should say, I feel similarly about other tableau builders such as Wingspan and Arc Nova, so your tolerance of lengthy sessions might be different to mine. The flow of the game is not typical of others in the genre. There's very little to do in that first season unless you happen upon the right cards and abilities to quickly generate a production engine. In that instance, one player might be up and running within the first few turns, generating extra actions and resources at every step. And this can lead to players getting out of sync, even at that very early stage. In Everdell, you choose when you move from Season 1 to Season 2, 3, 4, etc. Changing seasons brings your workers home, making them available for you to use for future actions, as well as giving additional workers and powering your production cards. It's a frequent occurrence in the game that some players might be playing in spring, while others have moved on to summer. It's even possible that one player might remain in the first season of the game, while others had advanced two seasons. The players are allowed to choose when they finish the game, usually when they've exhausted all available moves, but this doesn't finish the game for everybody. One player could potentially have a handful of turns still to take when all other players have finished the game. Everyone has to sit and wait for that final player to conclude the puzzle presented by their own personal tableau, which can take some time, because at this stage in the game there's an awful lot to consider. So we have a game with a frustrating, restrictive start and a drawn-out, uneven end game. And these problems... Well, they feel less significant with repeated plays. Everyone knows what to expect and how to use the game flow to their advantage. But for new players, it all tends to feel just a little bit off, like maybe we've missed a rule or something. I'm deducting one point for the unusual flow of the game and another point for the potential downtime and long duration at higher player counts. But nonetheless, Everdell still remains at the top of my ladder and its positives far outweigh any negatives. It is extremely engaging, and it only gets more so with repeated plays. One of the core principles of good product design is creating a product that can grow with its user, and Everdell excels here. The base game alone fulfills this criteria. I have never tired of it. You'll continue to discover new strategies even after many plays, and there's enough variability in the event objective cards, available worker placement spots, and of course the card draw to present a new puzzle in every session. But once you incorporate expansions, the growth is exponential. You can shape Everdell to your preferred playstyle, whether that means more strategic options, more restrictions and constraints, more interaction, or even playing solo. And each of these options provides a different type of challenge. So what are my takeaway lessons from Everdell? Well, one, a game doesn't have to be perfect to be a huge success. Everdell has some rough edges, and the learning from James Wilson and Starling Games is evident as the system evolved over multiple expansions. Number two, theme is still a huge factor for attracting interest in a product. Everdell demonstrates that a theme doesn't have to be totally new, but a game is elevated when the design team commit to the theme, immerse themselves in it, and treat it with love and respect. We've seen this over recent years with the massive success of Wingspan, which is clearly a labour of love for Elizabeth Hargrave. James Wilson, Starling Games and Andrew Bosley could not have done a better job of realising a forest critter community. 3. Putting constraints on players may create interesting strategic choices, but it can also lead to frustration. A designer should do what they can to guide players towards the most fun choices and avoid strategic options which bypass the most interesting engaging aspects of gameplay. Number four, if you have a strong vision for a product in terms of presentation, narrative and physical form, it's okay to riff on existing mechanisms. For many players, Everdell will be their first worker placement game, or their first tableau builder. It matters little to those players that Agricola, Kalos, Race for the Galaxy and many others came before. James Wilson's central idea of combining Agricola with Race for the Galaxy to make a generic city building game is a mediocre one. 
Retheming the game in a forest setting was a moment of inspiration, and the execution by the team of Wilson, Bosley and Starling Games is second to none. Everdell proudly sits at the top right of my idea execution matrix, a spot reserved for only the most successful commercial products. I'm hoping to find the time for more deep dives into well-established evergreen titles over the coming months. What better way to learn about product design than looking at proven sellers, standing on the shoulders of giants, and all that. So I'll leave you with a design challenge. What beloved fictional setting from books, TVs, or film could you adapt into a rich, lived-in setting for a new board game? You don't need to own the actual license. Everdell recalls Redwall and Mouse Guard, but it has its own personality. What two or three mechanisms would help you to realise your fictional world? If you'd like to learn more about product design for board game designers, click on the link. And until next time, all the best.